Have, have you ever been, I'm sure some of you have, to um, Gettysburg uh, War Memorial? How many of you have been there? And those who have never been, I encourage you to go. Uh, there was a time, you know I'm a history buff, I love history. I went alone. I didn't take anybody. And I walked myself years ago. It gives you a very somber feeling because there were so many casualties for no reason. <laughs> well, they had reason. Thousands of young men were killed, brothers killing brothers. It, it does affect you when you go there in that hallowed ground, when you, when you think of those died young men. And then, of course, the great speech that Abraham Lincoln gave. As you think of this, you feel sorry. Civil War. But Paul the Apostle, he is sort of saying the same thing in a different way as I'm going through the book of Romans, that many times Christians experience civil war in themselves. And we walk around hurt, defeated, wounded. Have you seen Christi Christians, defeated Christians, wounded Christians? They are sad. Something went wrong. And that's why I gave the title, Civil War of Christians, chapter 7. And I toyed with so many titles as I was preparing this sermon. Could I say, Winning the War Within? Or could I say, Battle Within? Or could I say, Spiritual Warfare? And, and with all that, suddenly the Lord placed in my mind of my experience of this Civil War place. Because that is something that you can't really logically explain. Now, in today's terms, you have to go back in the history to know. I know there are so many history buffs here. And, and then, of course, now we think it's senseless war, if you ask me. Killing. Paul is saying this. Christians sometimes face senseless wars within. One of the most difficult things a Christian face, a Christian faces in life, it's called regrets. Not any regret. What Paul is saying, this is the most difficult thing every Christian battle within. He himself is saying, number one, doing things they didn't want to do. He ended up doing things they hate doing. And then things they were supposed to do, could have, should have done, they didn't do it, and they sit in regret. Paul is saying, I have done that. And let's read, turn with me if you will, to Romans chapter 7. And when they do, committed all those things, they sit like those that go to Civil War museums feeling sad, and we are like that, spiritually speaking. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. You could read uh, verse 1 through 13 at home, but let me read 14. Follow me as I read. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm of the flesh, sold under sin, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is my, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. A lot of do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts, right? If you read the whole thing, you need to understand it clearly. So, I find it to be a law that when I wanted to do the right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of the Lord in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind and with my flesh I serve the law of sin. What Paul is describing here, his struggles. And he's asking a rhetorical question and making a statement the same way. He's asking, who is going to rescue me? Who is going to deliver me? Who is going to bail me out? And then he's using a term, how wretched I am. The word wretched here from the Greek origin is not how we think it is. It's so beautiful when you go back to the, the Greek origin. The wretched means in this context, worn out. <laughs> that means, Lord, I have been doing things I'm not supposed to do, I, I hate to do, and I'm not doing things I'm supposed to do. By doing so, I am worn out. I can't take this anymore. Have you, have you heard Christians say that? I can't take this anymore. Give me the reason. They probably won't be able to explain it. Because you don't see it outside. It's inside. The battle within you. The battle that you go through is not something that you and I can, can clearly see on somebody else's face. Although sometimes you could look at the face and say it if you're a counselor. Because you have the experience of reading the facial expressions of people. But sometimes you can't really see it, what's going on inside. But Paul is saying that I go through it. I'm worn out. I'm wretched. Who can deliver me? Then he points out the law of Moses and the grace of God. So the law is a set of rules. But the human nature, as Paul is saying, is that our human nature is to test the law all the time. And I am sure <laughs> Becky can attest to that people in Baltimore test the law all the time, right? And they're there, out in force. Have you ever noticed that the little kids, I know some of you have little ones now, two, three, four, five, you tell them not to do certain things, they'll go and do the very thing you tell them not to do. Caitlin said, I agree with you, right? <laughs> All the time. Why? Because they just wanted to go do something they know that I was told not to. Come on now, don't blame kids. You did the same thing. When you were little, ask your mom and dad. Yeah, I'm going to talk to Miss Simcoe, and she would tell me about her daughter. No, never mind. So we all have done that, right? What Paul is saying is that law makes us aware of sins and tells us not to do, but the nature would do the very thing that is forbidden. That is the sinful nature. Remember during the prohibition time, probably some of you lived, and I'm not sure, except I'm not sure that you're that old. And, uh, you know, when, when you read uh, the history, there were some moonshiners, bootleggers. They just came to the center stage. Why? Because they wanted to fight. And I was told that Joseph Kennedy was the bootlegger, but I'm not getting into politics. You all know. Someone said, no, he got the license, liquor license, after the prohibition. You go. If you're a Democrat, you should know better. Anyway, so <laughs> this is what happened during the time of prohibition. That, that the people said that, hey, we will defy the law. That is sinful nature. The law is a pointer to sin. It tells you what's wrong, but it's not going to change anyone internally. It can't. Well, you, you, you defy the law, then there's the, the human law that we placed in, in, our, in our daily life. Cops, officers would come and catch you and put you in jail, arrest you. And then you go to the, uh, the, um, uh, the court, and then there's a court date, then you pay for it. Sometimes, you know, I, I don't have... Um, these days, uh, belief in our system, court system, sometimes it's just hard because the lawyers, they lie to the teeth and win the cases when you know that things are truly went wrong somewhere. So we have another police department person here, Montgomery County, and uh, Brother Clyde. So, hey, and if Rob is here, it'd be complete that we have half of us police department folks, right? That's good. So I'm talking about that now. And here's a list of things. Probably you have never looked at this way, but I'm going to go over that. And there's so many fill in the blanks, and I'm going to test your memory. And if you would turn your bulletins to the back of the page, and uh, we'll go through the Ten Commandments. And look at the law and what Paul is saying here, why he's not able to, and why we're not able to keep it. What's the first commandment? Write it down. You shall have no other gods before me. All right, if you have written it down, you're good. All right, no other god before me. This is the commandment against worshiping God other than one true God. Brother Sifa sent me a, a video, which I 
I'm just circulating it to everybody, is in Texas. And Muslims calling it a, a Muslim day in Texas. And they gather in front of the Capitol and uh, the, all the Muslims were talking. There was a brave Christian woman went to the microphone, took it. This is a Christian nation, and Jesus is the Lord. This is not a Muslim nation. She just spoke her word out, and she was escorted out. I thought to myself, that was a bold move of that lady. And then I said it to my brother in Canada. Then he looked, I said, what's wrong with you Christians in the United States? Can't you stand up? <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, what it is is that we're not going to blatantly go and worship Muhammad or Buddha or a Krishna or any other gods in the world. We, we don't do that. We're Christians, right? I'm talking about the Christians having the battle within. But in the New Testament, the same thing is recorded in a different way. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, and he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or money. See, money in itself is not evil. It is good. You know, we all work for salary, don't we? I mean, all those government workers, you don't go to the government office, I love my government, I'm going to work for free. You don't go into your boss saying that, oh, I love my job, love my office, love you, sir, ma'am, and I'm going to work for free. We don't do that, right? No. Yes, we all need to live. Money in itself is not evil, but then what the scripture tells us is that, that we have a struggle. Sometimes when we are in need, we worship money. The root of all evil is the love of money. So what the New Testament tells you is that you shall not keep any God before me is that we don't keep other gods, culturally speaking. But we do sometimes keep this money God. There are three things families split apart these days, three reasons. You know those as a counselor, three reasons. The top reason is money. Families split apart. Because they worship. And we struggle, let's admit that, right? Uh, there's a time of need and we struggle deep within because money becomes God. That's what Paul is saying, that I do things that I hate to do and we don't want to give priority to money, but then we fall right back into saying that, well, I need this, I pursue after that. If I need to put my faith away and pursue after money, I may do that. Some Christians do that, get into all kinds of trouble. God says, no, you can't serve two masters. If you worship God, worship Him. In the time of need, ask Him. He will supply all your needs. Do your job. Get the things the right way. Secondly, the second law. You shall not make graven images. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make anything. Now, I want to take you to the mountaintop, Mount Sinai. We probably won't be able to go to Mount Sinai because it is Egyptian and then all these troubled side. And if it's clear, we might go. And Mount Sinai, it's nothing but a desert. Uh, you, you don't have anything to see but the mountaintop, that's all, because you don't even know exactly where they walked and stuff like that. But then Moses was called to come to the top of the mountain. And when he was on top of the mountain, the Lord began to give him the rules, the laws. And at the bottom of the mountain, foothills of the mountain, something else was taking place. What was it? The people were making a golden calf image. They told Aaron, Aaron, Let's make something because Moses went up and he's done. From chapter 30 to chapter 31 in the book of Exodus, God was giving him instruction. It probably took a long time for Moses to get it all done. And then when he was getting it from the Lord, people were so restless down below. And they said, well, we were abandoned. Let's do something on our own. So they began to make graven images. And the Lord noticed that and told Moses, Moses, go down and see this stiff-necked people. That's precisely the, the, the term Jesus, God used. So I want you to go down to these people. They're stiff-necked. Guess what, Moses? I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to make you a great nation. And Moses said that he pleaded. He implored the Lord. So, Lord, please, 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 don't kill them all. 
Remember you gave the promise to Abraham, promise to Isaac, promise to Jacob. The only person in the Bible ever held God from doing what he wanted to do was Moses. Don't do that. Don't do that. God, listen to Moses. All right, Moses, I'll give you a chance. Go down and, and try to straighten out people. See what you can do. So Moses came. We know that, right? He, he did what he did. He broke the law and, and so many people were killed. And have you ever wondered why they did what they did? Two reasons. People never had any personal relationship with God. They were always through Moses. They never had personal contact. Number two, delays. They considered delays of God was abandonment. He abandoned. He's not going to, to help us anymore. Now translate that in today's culture. What we do, sometimes we pray and pray and pray and pray. God delays and God delays. And there's no personal relationship with God or Savior. And if you don't have personal relationship with Him, and when you face the delays in life, guess what? You resort to make something else as your image. Perhaps something that pleases you. You would fulfill the desires of your heart and that becomes your idol. Anything that play, takes the place of God, whether in heart or outside, becomes the idol. What Paul is saying, I struggle with that. I struggle with this because every time I have a practical need, I'm struggling. Every time God delays, I'm struggling. You and I go through the struggle. That's why he said there's a, there's a civil war within. We all go through it. We fight that. We don't make idols per se, but there are so many things that will become idols in our hearts. Third command. Keep your Sabbath day holy. The new Sabbath day, I need to uh, preach one day about that. The new Sabbath day for Christians is the Lord's day, the first day of the week. That's when the early church gathered. Uh, you know, it happens to be uh, uh, Sunday, first day of the week. People don't go to church on Sunday. There's no punishment, right? And we don't call them saying that we, you know, you have to pay the retribution and all that. But do you know something? We live in a county where they have all kinds of things on Sundays. And I, I take this serious because I cannot keep myself away from worshiping the Lord on Sunday, whatever it might be. And I understand there are one or two Sundays or three or four Sundays we miss, it's fine, but it's a command of God. We have to have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. That is a command. And keep that holy. That's why we come to worship the Lord on Sundays. Remember Kathy Pruitt, the founder of Chick-fil-A? He's a wonderful Christian. And when, when he started this, and he said, I'm going I'm to give uh, a day off on Sundays. People asked him why. He said, I want my workers to go to church and worship God. Come on, you're in business. They said, I don't care. And when Columbia Mall, remember where it used to be, we didn't have everything. Hex was on one end, and I believe Sears was the other end. And a few strip stores there, a little, little, you know, eatery place there. But then they renovated it. Brought Nordstrom and Lauren Taylor, the whole nine yards. The big food court, have you ever been there? And then, uh, uh, and then Chick-fil-A applied to be in there in the beginning. It was denied. The request was denied when they were renovating it. Why? Because I was on the, the committee of the, uh, the development on Route 1 Corridor when uh, the Howard County changed hands from, from private to Johns Hopkins. There was a big money transfer at the time. So they had a committee meeting to, to see how we can renovate Route 1 Corridor. I got out of the committee because it was all pre-planned. Why do you have a committee when you have all pre-planned? So during that time I was told, I said, yeah, this is what happened. Is this. Chick-fil-A was denied because they were going to close on Sundays. You don't do that in the mall. But you know what happened? A few months later, they were invited. Come on in. <laughs> we want you in. Guess what? We might lose things in worldly sense if you don't keep the Sabbath holy and that is ordained by the Lord. But then at the end, the world would come to you. You might lose some money, your business on a Sunday a little bit. But then when you give that to the Lord and God comes back with a reward, you know, you can never outgive God. You come to God and do whatever God calls you to do and worship God in truth and spirit and he will bless you. We don't. We have the struggle, just like Paul says. Number four, 
you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. You know, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless when we misuse his name. Here's a command. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. That means do not swear God's name, although I've been surprised by some seasoned Christians cussing out. Although many people believe that taking the Lord's name in vain is only uh, cussing, referring to cussing, it's much more than that. We need to think of God as a holy God to be revered. You know, when we pray to the Lord, sometimes we pray as though He is our, uh, our, our bellboy. He said, I'm going to give you uh, my, my presumptuous to-do list, my laundry list, and I want you to fulfill everything. Here's the list. Lord, I want you to do this, do that, do that. And then every time when you pray, tell me one time, I'm guilty of that too. Tell me one time that we just went to the Lord and then did not ask a thing. And I just praise God for your holiness. I thank you, God, for being my God. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. I thank you, God, for things uh, that you've done in my life. And you are a holy, awesome God. I revere you. Amen. We don't finish it, do you? Then we have the list. Nothing wrong. But then what God is saying is that when you go with that kind of a list, not being mindful of the holiness of God, then you, you definitely take God lightly. That is taking God's name in vain. vain. And here it is. If we confess to be Christians, but act and think like the world, using profanity, then we take the Lord's name in vain. When we misrepresent Christ through our actions in our workplace, we misrepresent God and His name in vain. When we say we love him, Lord, I love you, and do the very thing he hates, we take his name in vain. Paul is saying, I'm having this struggle. I'm sure all of us have this struggle, don't we? Sometimes we inadvertently do that. And so I, and we go to the Lord, Lord, oh my goodness, I've done this. I'm struggling with this. That's a war within I'm talking about, folks. This is about Christians, Paul is writing. And then number six. No, number five. Oh, I don't want to skip that. That's wonderful. Honor your father and mother. A sermon in itself. Honoring your father and mother. Being respectful. You know what it is? It means esteem their position. Let me read to you. Matthew 15. Matthew 15. 3 through 9. Jesus reminded the Pharisees of the command of God to honor father and mother. And they said they were obeying the letter of the law because they added traditions and essentially their rules and overrule God's law. What it is is that you give the lip service, but then you don't honor. Here's something probably I told you. I was a little kid. I knew my parents were missionaries and there's, there's a store. I've got to walk at least about two miles to a little store in the village to get something. In the evenings, I love soccer, so I just go and play soccer. And when I come back from school, homeschool my grandmother. So then uh, my dad would just call, hey, hey, come here. I want you to walk two miles and get this little thing from the store, walk back. And uh, my dad, tall man, six-footer, uh, and then I'd say, yes, yes, dad, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. But all the way, I'll be calling my dad names in my heart. This man has nothing to do. And he could have walked two months, got a long leg, I'm a little boy, and you know, he could have gone two months in two seconds and come back, and I got to go and walk, you know, play my soccer. My friends would already, you know, he's drawing me in their team, and my name was drawn, and he's sending me. It was, I'm going, obedience, right? So partial obedience, disobedience. That's lip service. When you say, Father, honor your father and mother, it means it's, an, it's, it's, it's a word that demands action. That means you don't only just not only say it through your, your lips, but your heart. Where's your heart? Do you love your mother? Do you love your father? It's a command. As a matter of fact, this is the only command that has benefits that your days be longer. You read Exodus 20. And Paul is saying, I'm having the problem. I know I'm supposed to honor, but I'm not. That's exactly what he's saying, is that I'm doing things I hate to do. Why? Why do you think that people do not give respect? Because their feelings hurt or their things were not heard. And so, it's, or their needs were not met. Or maybe they had an agenda like me as a little boy. I had my own agenda. 
I won't say anything to my father, but that all along, I, I was, you know, calling my father all kinds of names. You know, my father was smart enough when he came back and said, are you okay? I said, I'm okay, Dad. I said, now you can play a game. He said, no, you're not okay. I said, because I took you out of soccer game. He said, no, no, no. I lied. See that? No, 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 no. I was not thinking. Then the guilty conscience killed me all the way. I didn't play soccer well at all because I know my dad found out that I was, you know, calling his name. But I didn't say anything. You know, fathers have a way of reading kids' heart. And that's exactly what Jesus does. I said, God is looking at Paul. Hey, I know you were having a struggle. So no, 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 Lord, no, Lord. I go to church. I read the Bible and pray. No, no, he knows better. Number six, you shall not murder. We're all okay in that. I'm sure that none of us have committed murder here. If so, please go to Miss Becky. She'll take you straight. <laughs> all right. And hey, thou shalt not murder. And we don't do that, do we? No, no. We don't resort to that kind of evil. But 1 John 3, 5, note it down. It says in the New Testament, If you hate your brother or sister, you have already committed a murder. Hatred is unresolved anger. If you hate your fellow brother, if you hate your fellow church member, if you hate your relative, if you hate your sister, if you hate anybody who sits right next to you or behind you, around you, or anybody in your workplace, if you hate, that means you have committed the murder. It's a spiritual sense. Paul is saying in that sense, oh my God, my Lord, I have committed a lot of those mistakes in my life. I'm struggling. If Paul could say, we could say the same thing. I'm supposed to love everybody. No. And then Paul called people names. Do you know that? Yeah. At one point, Paul called Peter. They said, you fool. I'm sure they made it up afterwards. We get anger. But, but anger is the natural reaction that God has built in our body. Yes, we do get angry. But if you have that anger unresolved, guess what? It becomes sin. Then you murder. According to God's word here you murder if you if you hate unresolved anger is murder hatred is unresolved anger all right number seven you shall not commit adultery we don't go around and cheat every time do we just all the time anyone and what we do is this the bible tells clearly look at this i want you to know if you look at a woman with lustful eyes matthew 5 28 you have already committed Adultery in your heart. That means that includes laptops, iPhones, iPads, magazines, movies, excluded <laughs> stuff, the whole nine yards. I don't want to list everything. There's so many things, right? He said, if you look at anything, you've already committed. May not be physical, but mentally you did. And then Paul is saying, I'm having this struggle. Because I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm looking, I'm not having this struggle. And, and Paul is saying, I'm not supposed to do that, Lord. I do that. That I'm having this struggle. War with him. Remember civil war? I'm struggling with that. And then number eight, you shall not steal. Now, I don't steal. We don't steal, do we? Confess it now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right? If you go, if you steal, you go to jail, right? But stealing comes in many forms in Christian life. I'm not going into this. Stealing means cheating someone. Unfaithful workers. Cheating on taxes. Calling sick when you're not sick. Those are definitely stealing. Thou shalt not steal. Clear. Now we don't steal literally like in the Old Testament God was giving the law. You go and take somebody else's goat or somebody else's lamp. You don't do that. But then, you know, I'm sick today, right? On the other hand, I mean, Shelly has phone calls from her workers all the time. And I could overhear that, oh, I'm sick, I can't go to work. So, oh, t tell me again that she's so, tell me again, oh, what, what your sickness, the whole nine hours. And then she tells them, and said, bring me your doctor's certificate. And then after an hour later, I said, oh, I'm feeling okay, I'm going to work. <laughs> it's funny how people can do that. You know, it, it, it is some, sometimes Christians do that. Do you know that? And that's stealing. What Paul is saying, come on now, let's be practical. What, what Paul is saying, I do that. I'm struggling with this. I'm not supposed to do that, but I end up doing that. Then I have a war within me. Holy Spirit of God convicted me. Then I'm just walking around defeated. And then you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. 
False witness, what is false witness? False witness making an untrue statement with the intent to deceive. With the intent to deceive is the false witness. We don't do that sometimes. Uh, you know, Christians, you know, we, we don't do anything to deceive someone else. But then, there's something called white lie. I don't know who invented that word, white lie. White lie is also an untrue statement, but it's usually considered unimportant. It won't damage anybody. But sometimes what it does, it may be helpful and uh, ostensibly it can, can, can save you from doing something or, or be the benefit of you and others. I can give you an example. Remember when our little kids, I don't know whether you did it or not, but I'm sure most of people do it, and the, the, somebody on the other line called your home and the dad doesn't want to speak to him and then gets, oh, tell him I'm busy. Tell them I'm sick. Because they don't want. You know the Bible calls that? This is what we call is bearing false witness. White lie. It's a minor thing. But lie is a lie and we have this struggle. Paul is saying that. Yeah, we have this war within. Sometimes we fail and we give out the white lie. And guess what? After a while the Lord speaks to us saying, oh my goodness, I'm having this trouble. Finally, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, covet neighbor's wife, or male servant, or female, his ox, donkey, or anything. Why people covet? Because of discontentment. They're not content with what they have. So they always covet. We struggle in this. We cannot keep this coming because it's a matter of heart. When we break one law, we have broken all the laws. And I'm going to close with this. I'm perhaps shared with you before, but I think I must share this story, true story with you to close this. Because we all go through the struggle in all Ten Commandments. That's exactly what Paul is saying. All the Ten Commandments points you to what is wrong, but then the flesh within me, sinful flesh, it will do right the opposite. Break the law all the time. And we break all ten laws all the time, don't we? All of us are guilty. I met a guy who broke just about every law you could think of, both outwardly and inwardly. He was, he, he, when he was a little kid, his mother ran after other men and left the father. And the father did the same thing. He was neglected. So in, in, in the middle school, he started kind of meddling with drugs. And he got into drugs in the high school dropped out of high school, became the drug dealer of the town. And then he beat up quite a few people. And uh, he, he, he almost killed one person. He was in and out of jail many times, many times he was incarcerated. And then when he turned 20, they wouldn't let him out. He was in jail for all kinds of crimes he committed in York County Prison in Pennsylvania. So this guy, when he was York County Prison, for the first time, I went to see him in the orange suit. I went to see him. And then he was behind the, the, the glass window, bulletproof, on the other side, I'm on this side, and then we had to take the phone and talk, he won't look at my face, and he picked up the phone. I'd never seen him before, he had never seen me before. And he asked me, who are you? Why are you here? How do you know me? I mean, I was, man, he was asking all these questions and he was looking horrible. And then uh, he won't look at me, look at me. So he won't look at me, he was down. And I said, you know, I'm here. I'm a pastor of Bethel Baptist Church and your grandmother goes to the church. I know your story. I want you to look into my eyes. And he said, no, I don't care. Hung up the phone, walked in, gone. So I gave a few weeks, a few weeks, I went up to York County Prison again, and I asked the guard, and the guard said, he doesn't want to see you, sorry. Well, would you please go and ask him again, whether you can see me, sure. And as he came and sat, again, behind the bulletproof glass window, picked up the phone, and, and, the, and then uh, I told him, hey, I'm here. Why are you here? That's a word, again. Well, I said, I'm here to tell you that Jesus loves you. We love you. Whatever. Well, I'm telling you, yes. 
And he, he calmed quite a little bit. I said, well, if Jesus loves me, then why am I here in this prison? I said, no, he didn't put you in there. You put yourself in there. You know, sometimes when you talk to the prisoners, when they're receptive, you need to take the upper hand. Said that, listen to me, man. Then I, well, change my voice, preacher's voice. Listen to me. I said, oh, kind of. I said, you put yourself in here. Your mama didn't, your dad didn't, your grandparents didn't, and, and above all, God did, and you did. You dealt with drugs, and you beat up people, you almost killed. He said, shh, shh, talk quietly. He was on the other end. I said, I'm telling you the truth, buddy. That's what I heard from your grandmother. Is it all true? Well, all true. Then why do you come knowing that I'm a bad person? I said, that's why I came here, to tell you that somebody died for you. Who died for me? Jesus. At that point, I said, man, he was quiet. And then after that, I could see the tears coming out, and he hung the phone left. Nothing can change a person internally. Prison system would not change a person internally unless God changes the heart of the person. And that man cried. He said, I want the Jesus who died for me. I'm cutting short the conversation. He just shared his entire story. And he said, I love you, man. I never know you from the beginning. But Jesus loves you. He died for you. Regardless of what you've ever done in your life. He doesn't care. He nailed everything to the cross. I can't hold his hand or pray or anything like that. He was far away. He said, uh, can I pray with you? Absolutely. The man wept bitterly. I said, I need the Jesus. Well, even though you received Jesus, you still have to serve your time here. And But at your point in time, God will, God will make things happen. I'll come back and see you. He went back in. Do you know that his sentence was reduced after that? He came out, he was half at home, and, and he called me from there. He said, I want to be baptized. Look at the picture. Remember, some of you probably saw this. John Reeder baptized him. John Reeder. You know what John Reeder is doing? He got a GED, he's got a bachelor degree. He went to Israel to his master's, and he is an ordained Preacher today, got married to a beautiful lady and lives in Florida. He's a chaplain in one of the prison systems. You know what can change the inner struggle? Jesus. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. Let me read that. But I say, walk by spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What Paul is saying in Galatians is that it's the desires of the flesh that keeps you from what you want to do for God. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Winning the war within is possible. When you have relationship with God, yes, you can win the war within. Because rules, listen to this, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Parents, it's a good thing for you to know. You can have the rules, but have no relationship with your kid, the kid will be rebellious. Same thing with God. If you don't have a relationship with God, and you have all these rules, and you will tend to be rebellious all the time. But then, rules with relationship, guess what it's going to do? It's going to lead a person to repentance. That's exactly what John Rita did. Repented. Because there was a relationship between him and God. You build a relationship, then repentance comes. When repentance comes, your life changes completely. And you will win the war that is raging in you. Regardless of what you couldn't keep in, in your heart. All those Ten Commandments that I explained to you. And every now and then we break those things. And we go back to God and repentance. Lord, I want to be led by God the Holy Spirit. I have this remorse feeling. I want to repent of my sin because I have this relationship with you. Relationship alone can change people. Nothing can change. Are you struggling in something in your life? Would you surrender that to the Lord today? Two questions. Do you love the Lord? In your bulletin, we gave the promise right on top. Two things. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. 
And then said, the second is to love your Lord and then love your neighbor as yourself. And it said, with these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. When you love the Lord first, love your neighbor, you're not going to do break all those ten things that I explained to you. You won't have this trouble. Yes, we do at times. Then we go back to the Lord. Lord, I love you. Remember, relationship would lead to repentance. And we ask the Lord, forgive us, Lord. We repent of our sins. Because God wants us to have victorious life. He does not want us to have that somber feeling of being a victim of civil war with Him. He wants us to have victorious life. Let's bow our heads and pray together.